Hi, and welcome to this podcast dealing with the wonderful world of graphs. One of the best ways to communicate the results of a scientific investigation is graphing, creating an effective visual representation, which is the graph, of any data that has been counted, measured, and or calculated. So investigators or scientists often can easily see patterns in a carefully crafted visual display that may not be as readily apparent in like a data table just full of numbers. So these visual displays can clarify how measured variables might affect each other. So our goal here is a couple of things. Um, one is to determine which type of graph we really want to use. We'll look at very briefly a number of the different types of graphs you might come across, um, but we're really going to focus on line graphs here in this podcast. But we also want to uh, discuss how to interpret what a graph is actually telling the reader. And as a little hint here, you are the reader. So there's lots of different types of graphs out there, and there's more than the five that you see here. But here are a couple that are pretty common uh, to use in science, and you needn't keep them all straight or n know the difference or know exactly what they are right now. Besides a line graph that I already mentioned, which isn't even pictured here, um, bar graphs and probably histograms and maybe uh, scatter plots are going to be the most common. We also have um, what are called box and whisker plots and mosaic charts. Um, and all of these will compare different types of variables and different sets of data. And they all have their very useful place. The two that we are most likely to use here, or that we're even going to discuss, are line graphs and bar graphs. The line graph uh, that we're going to focus on here, the important thing to know here is that line graphs are really only appropriate when you are talking about a continuous process. A lot of chemical reactions, enzyme action, um, etc., those usually use a line graph and they show trends. And often, and you'll probably hear me revisit this, but often one of those variables is time. So again, the thing to keep in mind is a continuous process. Bar graphs, on the other hand, are only appropriate when you're talking about and comparing amounts or counts. So time can be used in a bar graph, but really it's typically uh, when you're comparing different sets of, of data where those categories aren't necessarily the same. So here even different types of fruit, they aren't the same types of fruits, and we're just counting a variable that is in reference to the different type of fruit. Again, more on those later. So here's an example, and what we're looking at here is a chemical reaction, and we assume here that this chemical reaction is a continuous process, and the process is that a certain amount of substance A is going to be remaining uh, as this chemical reaction proceeds over time. As you can see here, there's been four different actual data points that were collected, each of them at a different hour. So you can see that this chemical reaction actually proceeded from basically time zero to three hours after time zero. So that gives us four total data points. And again, it was over time. So we could plot that in a grid over time with the different readings being displayed as data points along the graph. So let's take a look at this data that is plotted visually on this grid where the time in hours is on the x-axis and the amount of substance A, here measured in milligrams, um, that is remaining as this chemical reaction proceeds through time. And these four data points represented here with the black dots on the line are the actual four uh, data points that were collected in the investigation. Since we assume that this is a continuous process, it's appropriate then to fill in or connect those dots. That, by the way, is not always appropriate. Here it is. Um, any point that we go to on this graph and, and take, for instance, uh, point Y and point X, since this is, this is a continuous process and we can um, fairly safely assume that this reaction is proceeding steadily, any point along this line 
can be interpolated. So interpolation is where we can pick any point along that so solid line and be pretty, uh, pretty confident that those points are accurate. Now notice where we have the broken line here. That broken line is uh, an extrapolated line. In other words, it goes beyond our actual data collection, but again, since it's a continuous process, and we assume here that it is going to be fairly um, continuous, or in other words, fairly um, steadily proceeding, we can, we can be safe to make some extrapolations here. Again, it's very important to actually represent that uh, with a broken line or a dashed line. And, and scientists would kind of say that we confess our ignorance here. We aren't certain, but we are confident. And there's no problem there. We just represent it with a dashed or broken line. It gives us a way to make very logical guesses, I guess, or predictions about any point after our data collection. Only if this is a continuous process. So I think here's a pretty important point worth communicating here, that graphs are a visual way to tell a story for the author, uh, for the scientist, for the investigator, and you need to keep that in mind. It doesn't matter if you are talking about uh, graphs that you see in a scientific publication, if you see them on TV, if you see them in the newspaper, you see them on social media, graphs tell a story, and that author is the one that is trying to convey a story and they unfortunately may have an agenda they may be trying to um, show you what they what they want data to um, to convey so here's an example just by switching the axes here or by numbering them differently the same data points can tell quite a different story which one of these data sets looks to be um, increasing with profit more rapidly. Here we have a bar graph, not a line graph, but again with these displaced axes, take a look at how the y-axis is numbered in both of these examples. And so the example on the right, um, we have very incremental numbers on the y-axis where they are very proportional to the entire data set. On the left, we have, um, we, have a, we have smaller increments and the difference between the two years seems very drastic. Watch out, the reader, that's you, needs to always be aware of the story the author is attempting to convey. So as we continue forward and learn a little bit more about graphs and upcoming podcasts, take a look here, and graphs can be very misleading. And one of the ways to be misleading is just throwing a whole bunch of data. And here I don't think the author is really being um, that clear on the message they are conveying. And this is really a complex graph. Now it may be accurate. The data within it may be very telling of a particular story, but it takes quite a bit of work uh, from the reader to really dig in and see exactly what the data is telling us. We want to be much clearer. Clarity is important and so is brevity. So we want to um, keep that in mind when constructing graphs. So remember our couple of points here. One, um, looking at different types of graphs that are appropriate, um, really diving into the initial or basics of line graphs, um, but always remembering that uh, the graphs convey a message, and it's up to the reader to figure that out. It's also up to the author to be authentic in uh, communicating data. As we move forward, our next conversation is going to be about the importance of setting up the graph properly with the absolute requirements for good graphing. Till next time.